Hello again, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Currently in the book of Hebrews, we're in chapter 11. We left off last time in verse 29. So we'll pick it up in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. I hope you can get your Bible so that you can follow along and read with me as we go verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. So while you're getting your Bible, hopefully, a quick reminder to you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And the important thing about this website is that, as its name reflects, it is the Bible verse by verse. I have been teaching the Word of God for <clears throat> verse by verse here on the Scripture Verse by Verse for over 33 years. <clears throat> and I have saved all my work. So there are almost four complete series going verse by verse through the entire Bible archived for you. All you have to do is click and listen to whichever series, whichever book of the Bible, whichever chapter, whichever section. Bring your Bible and a hunger for God's Word. That's all you need at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Okay, enough. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. <clears throat> when entering the promised land. The Israelites were told by God that he would fight for them. Their enemies, the inhabitants of that land, were given over to wick wickedness, totally. Some of them were actually half-breeds, Nephilim, like Genesis chapter 6 speaks about, irredeemable totally given over to wickedness. When I say half-breeds, I'm talking about half-fallen half angels and half-human beings. Read about it, Genesis 6. They were in the land when Israel got there, and uh, certain portions of it anyway. <clears throat> and when entering the Promised Land, the first wicked city to be destroyed by God was Jericho. God told his people, gave them instructions. He said, circle the city seven times. On the seventh day, they were to do it one time every day. And then on the seventh day, they were to circle the city seven times and then blow trumpets. They did, and the walls fell, and the city was destroyed. Now, that command makes no logical sense at all, except for the fact that God told him to do it. And it's always logical to do what the all-powerful, all-knowing God tells you to do. So they did. They believed the Word of God because they believed it. The Word of God was their compass, the only compass that they needed. And they obeyed, and it worked. Verse 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. So there was a prostitute, a harlot in the city of Jericho. Her name was Rahab. Unlike the rest of the people in that city who knew about the one true God, just didn't want anything to do with them. Rahab believed the word of God. So the word of God became her compass. And as a result, she sided with God's people and was spared. Rahab was saved by believing the word of God and acting on it. 32, and what shall I more say? 
For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in fight, flight, turned the flight of the armies of the aliens, that would be the inhabitants of the land. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Now, stop right there for a second. The things listed here are all positive. They were all the rewards of faith, good stuff. They were all the rewards of people living by faith. The good things that happened because they lived by faith, just as eternal life is the reward of faith in Jesus Christ today. So, obviously, sometimes when we believe the word of God and we live according to the word of God, even when it's difficult, God will reward us in this life sometimes. But there's a flip side, verse 35. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So while some were blessed because of their faith, some were tortured, some were killed, some lost everything that they had because of their faith and because they lived it. It has to be enough to do what is right in the eyes of God, no matter what the results might be. Countless Christians have made the choice to serve God by believing and adhering to his word, even though it cost them their life. They were smart enough to understand that avoiding eternal, everlasting hell was more important than avoiding suffering and death in this life. And there really isn't any comparison, is there? 36. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. Some <clears throat> have not died for their faith, but they sure have suffered for it. It's part of the package deal. You want eternal life through Jesus Christ? Then the Bible says, repent. Receive him as Lord and Savior. And if you repent and receive him as Lord and Savior, you're going to not only believe the word of God, but you're going to want to please Jesus and you're going to persevere to the very end, no matter what it costs you. Verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tested, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. A very hard life. Void of the pleasures of this world has often been the price of a Christian's faith, living the word of God. And I suppose anyone can do this. Anyone can water down the truth. They could have watered down their own testimony in an attempt to be friends with the world while still trying to be faithful to God, but they didn't because you can't do it. You can try, and many do try, but you can't do it, not in reality. It just doesn't work. Jesus said friendship with the world is enmity against God. We are either for Jesus or against Jesus. And if you're for Jesus, Chances are you're going to rough, run into some rough times in this world. Eternal life, avoiding hell, has to be good enough reason. Loving Jesus has to be enough for, for dying on the cross to pay for your sins. Has to be enough reason for doing the right thing. <clears throat> 39. And these all, having received witness through faith, received not the promise. In other words, 
The fact that they didn't receive all the rewards of faith while they were on earth didn't stop them from believing and living the Word of God. It was enough that it was the Word of God. It was enough that it pleased Almighty God. Faith in God's Word makes one willing to sacrifice the present for the future. It is a lie being told by countless Word of Faith teachers today that if you have faith and you live by faith, you'll be blessed. You have material possessions. And they promise all the things that Satan promises those who follow him. Health, wealth, popularity, power. None of those things are promised by God to those who are faithful to him. He promises trouble. Now, you may be blessed. Thank God for every blessing you get. But the only thing that he promises for living godly in Christ Jesus today is trouble. Sacrifice. That's what it is. Faith in God's word makes one willing to sacrifice the present for the future. Verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. All of God's people, both Old Testament and New, saved Israelites from the old days and Christians in the church age, are going to be rewarded for their faith. God's not going to let you do something for him or be faithful to him without repaying you, without giving you your wages. That's the kind of God he is. And God has not gone into great detail concerning what those rewards will be. But he has said, that our bodies will be raised never to die again. He has said that we're going to have a great time on the new earth forever and ever. That's a pretty good start. That's all I need to know. Whatever the details might be, that'll be fine too, whatever they are. Okay, chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, in this verse, God tells his children, who are Christians, that's who he's talking to, Christians. He's talking to you if you're Christian. God is telling you that he wants you to do two things, three things. Number one, he says, lay aside every weight. Number two, lay aside sin. Number three, run with endurance. So first, let's consider, God, consider God's command to lay aside every weight. The weights mentioned here in verse one refer to spiritual weights. They're not sins, but they are things that will hold you back spiritually. Technically, they are not against the rules. Technically, they are not sin. But they hinder your walk with the Lord. They keep you from going all out for Jesus. They are weights. They slow you down. They are things you condone that make it more difficult for you to live for Jesus and enjoy the blessings that go along with that. So God says, lay those weights aside. And then he says, lay aside sin, which so easily ensnares us. In other words, make a clean break from sin. If you're doing something wrong, then quit. And when you realize that you've done some wrong, something wrong, immediately repent and confess it and get back on track. Sin dishonors God. Sin steals our joy. Sin makes us feel guilty. Sin ruins our effectiveness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Consequently, God says, get rid of it. Repent of it. 
forsake it. There is no good reason to condone sin, but there are plenty of good reasons to forsake it. And then, number three, God tells us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. In other words, persevere with Jesus. Keep doing what is right. Keep believing the Bible. You see, those three things are pretty tall order, especially if God expects us to do them all the time. And of course he expects us to do them all the time. But I'll take it one step further and and say it's not just a tall order, it's impossible. It is impossible for a Christian to lay aside all those spiritual and moral weights. It is impossible for a Christian to get all the sin out of their life permanently, and it is impossible for Christians to run with patience the race that is set before them. Hold it more specifically. It is impossible for a Christian to do those things on their own apart from God's power. But, but, what we can't do on our own, God will do through us if we are his children through faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing is impossible for God. (coughs) Excuse me. God gives us the desire to do the right thing, and he also gives us the power to do the right thing. If we are his children by his grace and by his choice, The choice is, I should say, by his grace, the choice is ours. Moment by moment, second by second, we can do the right thing. We can lay aside every every weight. We can lay aside every sin. We can run with endurance. By God's grace, second by second, we can choose to do the right thing. Now, of course... Even as a Christian, we have a free will. And if we choose to walk in the flesh, if we choose to satisfy our sin nature, instead of walking in the spirit, pleasing God, if we do not do the right thing, well, that's our choice. But God has something else up his divine sleeve to get us to do the right thing. God has a trump card that he can play that will get his people to lay aside the weight, the sin, and to persevere in a righteous walk with Jesus Christ. And that something is his divine discipline, his divine chastisement. You say, well, explain divine discipline because I'm not sure I know exactly what it is. Okay, I'll explain it. Divine discipline consists of the things that come into our life that challenge us, that make us feel bad. Divine discipline refers to struggles, difficulties, suffering, and pain. Those are some of the ways that God disciplines. Perhaps it's the trial of not having something that you wish you had. Maybe it's the trial of having something that you wish you didn't have. Someone says, well, I thought those sorts of things just happened. I didn't know God had anything to do with it. Oh, yeah. Nothing just sort of happens if you are a Christian, if you are God's child through faith in Jesus Christ. Many Christians believe that the trials they experience are things that just happen. Don't you believe it? There are others who are convinced that their trouble is simply the work of the devil in their life. They blame the devil for everything. Or some people blame bad people for the troubles that are in their life. Bad people who do bad things to them. And that's why they have trouble in their life. But you know what? To view trouble that way is to look at it in a superficial, surface manner 
which really ignores what is actually happening. Trouble is not simply happenstance. Trouble is not simply the work of Satan or of bad people in the life of a believer. Although any one of those three things or all of them may be involved in some way. But Christians must understand that trouble of any kind is in reality the discipline of God. If we don't get that, if we don't understand that, then we will not profit from God's discipline. Again, if we don't understand that, then we're not going to profit from God's discipline. If we don't get that, then the sufferings we endure will not be the means to a greater good, which is what God intends them for, regardless of the human or demonic element involved. So when you, now watch this, when you as a Christian experience difficulties, your first thought should not be about some bad person who has done something terrible to you. Your first thought should not be about Satan causing trouble in your life. The devil isn't in control of your life. He doesn't call the shots in your life. God does. Satan is not sovereign. God is. The Bible says no plan or purpose of God can be thwarted. The Bible says that God works all things after the counsel of his own will. And you might say, well, do you mean, Moret, that Satan and bad people have no influence in my life at all? No, I'm not saying that. And no, the Bible does not teach that. But the Bible does teach that anything that the devil or bad people do to you must first be filtered through your heavenly father. And the Bible also teaches that if God allows bad, then he wants to use it to train you. It is his discipline. It is his loving chastisement. And I think I should probably clarify some definitions before we go any further here. It is important for you to understand that there is a big difference between divine punishment and divine discipline. Our Heavenly Father disciplines Christians for their good. Our Heavenly Father chastens Christians in order to train them so that they will become the type of people that he wants them to be. On the other hand, God does not discipline non-Christian. He does not discipline <clears throat> the unsaved of the world. He doesn't discipline them because he's not their father. God is not the father of the unsaved. God is their judge. God is their God. He is their creator, but he is not their father which is why God punishes Christ-rejecting sinners, not for their good, but to satisfy his justice. When punishing lost sinners, God is expressing his holy wrath. He is satisfying his perfect justice. But always remember that the Lord God Almighty does not punish Christians. That's not what your trouble is about. God, is, God does not punish Christians. Why doesn't he punish Christians? Because Jesus has already been punished for Christians. And God would not punish the same sin twice because that would violate his perfect justice. <clears throat> the Bible says in Isaiah 53, 5, that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. 
The Bible goes on to say in Isaiah 53 that we all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So Jesus satisfied God's righteous anger and Jesus satisfied God's holy justice. So when you and I, <clears throat> as Christians, are disciplined, it cannot be to satisfy God's justice, and it cannot be that God is angry at us, because he isn't. Now, that's not to say that God's chastisement doesn't feel like punishment sometimes. It can be very painful at times. However, if you are a Christian... Chastening comes from your loving Heavenly Father who does it because he wants what's best for you in the long run. Let's read one and two together. <clears throat> Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before us, or before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So what does God tell us to do? Look unto Jesus. See. Jesus endured horrendous times and unspeakable suffering in order to accomplish the will of God. <clears throat> he endured unspeakable suffering, suffering to the degree that you and I cannot possibly fathom in order to pay for our sins, to save us from hell, and to accomplish our everlasting salvation. Jesus endured it all for us, and he did it in the will of God. We Christians are told to remember what Jesus suffered in the will of God <clears throat> so that we will respond correctly to whatever type of pain, whatever type of suffering, or trouble that God allows to come into our life as his children, as Christians. See? Consequently, God says, when you are suffering, when you are being chastened, when there's something in your life that you don't like, when there's something missing that you wish you had, where there's something that you, when there's something that you have that you wish you didn't have, in other words, when you are experiencing trouble of any kind, when you are experiencing, in other words, the chastisement of God as a Christian, when you are suffering in any way, in any way, in any way, look to Jesus. When you are pain, in pain, keep your eyes on Jesus. When you feel terrible because something bad has happened to you, Remember, that's what happened to Jesus. And remember Jesus, because that will help you to persevere through all the bad, just as he did. And you can trust, if you remember, that that bad was not an end in itself, but a means to a greater end, a greater good for us. So endure your chastening, knowing that God has allowed it for the same reason, to accomplish a greater good, spiritually speaking, for you. To draw you closer to God. To make you more useful to Him. It was painful for Jesus to accomplish the will of God. It is painful for us to draw closer to God too. And to be use, useful to God. Just part of the deal. Okay, I'm out of time. Continue studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Remember, I'm not underwritten by a large church or any denomination. So if you want to be a part of this ministry, pray for me. Pray for God's word. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com. 
and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.